I am I'm Stefan Thiel. I work for the South Australian Government or the Geological Survey of South Australia. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is sort of the Australian perspective, and I'll also give a little bit of an overview of what Australia is actually currently doing in the mineral exploration states. You probably have heard about the Uncover Initiative. Um, so all of this work, I'll be talking a lot about magnetotelluroids, but also the combination of that with isotope geology, some seismic tomography studies, and really how that kind of guides us, and we're actively using it in a survey for mineral exploration. Um, there's a lot of people, I want to think, I can't read them all out, but the results I'm going to show are really in collaboration with this particular University of Adelaide, uh, Geoscience Australia, and some other surveys as well. Um, and also obviously access to supercomputing powers, etc. So it's very much a collaborative um, exercise and what I'm talking about. I just want to start off perhaps with a minimal system footprint. This follows on and thanks for leading in. Uh, can uh, some of the uh, overviews or some of the schematic diagrams that we have from the Uncover initiative. What this is really talking about in terms of a minimal system, you can also look at it from an energy point of view. There's a lot of energy fluxes, you have an energy source that can be heat, etc., or stresses, forces, um, that then leads to a sort of self-organizing system here, which may hit a threshold barrier, and that's how you kind of enrich your, your minerals at some point. And then you have an energy sink, and you know, the energy really drives most often uh, fluids and or uh, magma through the system, and that's really what we're after. So the question is, do these energy fluxes have some sort of physical property that we can measure? That's really the underlying idea behind all of it. So Uncover is the new, um, it's really so national um, exploration initiative in one way or another. That is really we bought buy in from the surveys, but also our industry is very much behind it as well as academia. And it's got really four main themes. Um, and these are the four main themes, you know, after a lot of consultation, it's all crystallized out as the ones, the main questions we need to ask in order to find the next big order puzzle. And this is about characterizing cover, it's about uh, understanding lithospheric architecture where MT really comes in. It's about the chemical footprints of ore deposits, so really around the ore deposit scale. And then obviously time plays a big role, but this is where the 4D geodynamic um, uh, and metallogenic evolution comes in. And I should also maybe point out um, that it's really going across scale here. So we're talking going from continental scale all the way to the camp scale. So we're seeking techniques that can really slot in to any of these uh, different scales that we are exploring. So traditionally you would only sort of be in the camp and deposit scale with your geophysical um, exploration, but we really want to understand all of it. And as I'm going to talk a lot about MT, the nice thing about this technique is that you just need to swap your sensors out and use different frequencies, and you're measuring from a few tens of meters down to hundreds of kilometers. So that's the nice thing about really going across all scales. So for us it's a very important exploration school, uh, tool you know, amongst many others, but that's a really big one. Um, Australia has embarked on the Oslo MT grid. That's a long period MT grid where we want to cover the entire continent. Um, so if we're done, it's going to be around just over 2,000 uh, different sites. Um, again, it's run by several institutions. It's a big, big exercise. It's going to be the next biggest national pre-competitive data set. And really the idea is that these stations, which are spaced every half a degree, so that's about 55 kilometers, is to map really the lithospheric architecture, so understand the mantle, lower crust, mid crust um, of the continent, and just really map it all out. How does it look like? Um, you probably know what MT is, so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. The parameter that we're sensitive to is the electrical connectivity. So think again about the energy fluxes and the fluids, etc. You know, we all know that the minor conducting phases, you know, precipitates and also fluids have really low electrical resistivity. So that's really um, obviously the main target that we're after. That's just one of the OSLAM sites here, so quite often we, um, often we have to chop her in, deploy the sites, you can see the electric um, field being recorded here, and then the magnetic field central. So that's how one of the sites looks like. And we're recording for up to three weeks, and there's a very good reason for that, um, because you get these response curves which are just much cleaner, so the right-hand side here, which is a plot of the apparent resistivity and the phase of a frequency. So on the right hand side of the plot, you know, you have frequencies up to or periods up to 10,000 seconds. That's really actually imaging the mantle. You can clearly see they get much cleaner data if you record for three weeks or more instead of four days. So really the deployment is very important. 
and we now have up to 75 instruments to really build it out nationally um, in a very consistent and quick manner. So obviously depth of investigation, um, just really briefly want to point this out, this is probably one of the most important uh, information about MT, so the subsurface board conductivity or resistivity and the period determines how deep you can see. So again, that's why we're going out for a very long time and we are often in crater environments with a sedimentary conductive cover. So we want to make sure that we get up to a period of 10,000 seconds to really see down to several hundred kilometers. The current status of Austin looks a bit like this. Um, in South Australia, we have really have done a lot of investment in uh, pushing this deployment forward. We have done uh, about two-thirds of the state, and we're going to talk about some of this. G-Science Australia has worked a lot on uh, Victoria and New South Wales, and we now also have funding secured to really go into the northern part of the Northern Territory, uh, to Western Australia and Queensland, as well as finishing off New South Wales, which is here. So we're well on track and, uh, you know, that we hopefully have all this data collected in a few years' time. So today I'm going to talk about a model that uh, really concentrates very much on the Gola Crater. So it's going to be the central part here of South Australia. Adelaide is here. Also shows some results that we just published uh, by a PhD student. She's now graduated from University of Adelaide. Um, she looked at the transition of the Flinders Range and Gondomona province with some really interesting results in terms of mineral uh, potential, but also general tectonics. Um, just the Gola Crater and a very rough overview, all you need to know is really that along the margins of the Gola Crater on here and all the red colors, um, there was an event at 1590 which in place the hilt of the sweet granites and all the mineralization that we have, the IUCG mineralization, gold mineralization in South Australia around the Gola Crater is associated with that. Olympic Dam sits right here. Uh, prominent hills up there, so these are really the major big mines that we have in South Australia. Um, and just generally we have sort of more low metamorphic rocks in the eastern part, coming to slightly higher uh, metamorphic rate as you go further to the west. That's just the geological background. But I really want to talk about the grid of Austin MT sites, the long period MT sites, um, that you know we've up run a 3D inversion model of this. So it just really spans across the entire crater and we now have more um, data for the western part. So we actually get better constraints along the western rock margin of the Gola. But really the eastern part is what I want to talk about. So this is where we do have the deposits. So seeing their footprint is really interesting. So I'm just going to jump straight into the model. Uh, what you see here on the right hand side is a 35 kilometer depth slice. Um, across this model. So again, the constraints here, the triangles are the MT stations. Um, blue colors is very resistive. And you can already see that in the lower crust, you can very clearly mark out where the Gaul crater on proper sits. And then you have the margins here where the connectivity is much higher or the resistivity is lower. So we will attribute that with a generally uh, rheologically weak um, crust, which has seen a lot of deformation and also fluid kind of coming through. These are fossil fluid pathways. Um, which then kind of lead to precipitation of either sulfides, graphite, and these sort of things. Um, but the really in interesting point is that all the mineral deposits, again, Olympic Dam is the red point here. Uh, we've got a, so a couple of green ones, one of them from the hill, Carapatina down there, which just opened as a mine, they're all lying along the margin of the crater. And so again, this is looking at a data set that gives you a much deeper image than what you would normally do in terms of exploration, where potential field data gives you maybe responses from the top few kilometers. So you can really see that Lithosphere and Arctic has a primary control of where these deposits lie. Interesting as well, if you look at some of the cross sections, all of them are going down to about 400 kilometers. You can see again sort of the Archean core here, which kind of bottoms down to over 200 kilometers. What's interesting, and I'm going to show a video in a second, um, is that we would normally expect all of the craton to be very resistive, so blue in color because it's Archean and should be depleted, um, so that means it's got a high resistivity. But well, we see the opposite in at least some part, and it sits sort of roughly under this area. And as we call, just call it the Gola Crater on Mantle Conductor. It starts from about 100 kilometers depth and extends further down. You know, the depth extends is obviously a problem with any electromagnetic method, as you know. So it could be much shallower, but much more conductive than uh, what it's displayed at. But it's clearly evident there's something very conductive sits there, so something else must have um, either metasomatized the mantle or really has put in a big fluid input. I'm going to show you a video now uh, where you just really see that in 3D. So you see the outline of the coast here. 
Um, and I'm going to turn on a few icy surfaces. Blue again is a 2000 ohm meter icy surface, and then it goes down to the yellow one, which is a 10 ohm meter or 50 ohm meter icy surface. And it looks a little bit blobby, but you can clearly see that um, there's the Air Peninsula conductor, which has been known for a long time. It's been reported in nature in the mid 80s. Um, that's basically graphite sitting within the crust. As we then sort of turn around towards the central part of the goal, you see the the up here and the craton itself in blue, but this thing here is uh, quite clearly the mantle conductor that I was talking about. So again, you know, what we think is that initially everything would have been blue or very depleted, that some sort of thermal and subduction or super subduction event um, caused this fertilization. As you would have seen before, you know, there's a clear connection between the mantle conductor and then also what, um, the connection up through the crust along the margin. So whatever has caused the metasomatism of this part of the mantle has had some connection up the, up the side of the craton to where the ore deposits are now. And we see definitely the clear connection along the eastern side here and also along the north. Uh, but I need to stress that we have some new data now where you can sort of start to trace this around the western part as well. So we also need to think a little bit about what this means and I talked a little bit about metasomatism already. Um, you know, normally when we look at empty images at these sort of depths, we think about, well, you know, you have either active saline fluids in there or melts. And we've done studies in Ethiopia where that's clearly attributable, but in this case, this is a stable craton, so you would not expect to have any fluids around anymore, and they would have long uh, dissipated and moved up through the system. There's no real reason to believe there's any melts, it's just too cold because it's stable again. Uh, so people then invoke things like sulfide magnetite, but they usually are more to be seen in the crust. And within the mantle, there's a lot of laboratory studies that kind of focus on hydrogen diffusion and anomaly, anomaly anhydrous rocks um, or graphite. Now, and you can clearly see this in one of these uh, plots here. So these are the main constituents of the mantle, the olivine, pyroxene, garnet. And it's just kind of showing the resistivity versus depth. And you can clearly see that the solid lines are it's basically a dry olivine, so it's dry lithosphere. And as you introduce a bit more hydrogen into the system, and there's several different studies that don't necessarily um, agree in the absolute numbers of it, but they all say that if you introduce hydrogen, you do increase your conductivity of the system. So there could be one explanation, except that the conductor is actually just a little bit too conductive to just be explained by hydrogen alone. It's not um, the only occurrence in the world, but this is where we can see this. So you actually see that in the slave craton. There's probably some similarities in the tectonic history between the slave and the gola in terms of fertilizing events that impinge on the Archean craton itself. We see this in Kappa craton in South Africa. There's this conductor here, which is a bit unusual. And the same in the Dawa craton. People talk about different causes, graphite, hydrate, minerals, sulfides. It's very different. No one really knows to be sure, and it's one of the studies that we need to understand a lot more about the petrology of the system. We know that we've got a very heterogeneous um, mantle source in the Gold Craton, which is possibly related to a fossil or active super subduction at about 1590. Um, and there's also one really interesting thing to note is that we have also a fluorine anomaly. Um, so all the hit of the sweet granites and the volcanics in the area have got very high fluorine. And it's just been very recent studies that only came out last year from lab measurements on phlogopite that seem to suggest that the connectivity of phlogopite is very, very high. So that's another uh, possible hint that really shows you you may have some hydrated minerals, at least at some levels in the lithosphere that we still have kicking around that gives us this sort of response. Most likely, it's all of the above. It's hydrogen, fluorine, etc. in hydrated or um, in the crystal lattice that gives us that entire response of a Lower resistivity, or lower resistivity and higher conductivity in the goal of Um Do we see this somewhere else? We kind of do. These are, um, again, as a uh, depth slice from the US array, so coming more towards the North American craton. Yellowstone is somewhere around here. These are the Snake River plains, and you clearly see at a similar depth at about 150 kilometers. Again, you would expect perhaps to see that you know, the resistivity would be much higher here in more cartonic areas, but it's clearly been perturbed. And you also see a lower reduction of um, resistivity, and there's also a higher fluorine to be seen on the surface. Coming back to our model, I just want to show also what this means in terms of other data sets. So it's not just MT that kind of shows us that the Gola is in some way special or very fertilized. 
the ISO surfaces here, this is the resistor, um, the really thick resistive lifters here that we have, that's the conductor sitting just behind it. The ISO surface that's underneath is actually a thermal lithosphere sensory boundary that's derived from the shear weight model. So it's basically tracing the 1350 degree um, ISO surface and you can clearly see that the thickest part of the lithosphere we have in self reserves sits right underneath where we have the resistor. So again, two different data sets, but are really talking about this very similar correlation. Um, that thick depleted lithosphere, uh, you know, is very resistive, uh, shows the thick lithosphere, and then you have thinning lithosphere everywhere else. And this just shows um, a slightly uh, a different point of view is that if you now concentrate on the conductor, which is here, that's the mantle conductor at several uh, hundred kilometers depth. Olympic Dam sits right there. The gray icy surface is just taken arbitrarily at 4.61 kilometers per second. That's from the shear weight model from Brian Kennett. And what it shows is again that around the conductor we have a slight reduction in shear wave velocity. So again, if you kind of fertilize a mantle to introduce fluids, you should also see a slight reduction in shear wave velocity, and that's what we see. And then as you step out, the shear wave velocity does increase again. So there's a nice correlation again between two very different data sets. And that's just uh, showing the same thing again. And one last point I want to make, and we obviously have to kind of tie this in with some of the uh, surface geology. And this plot is trying to do that. Again, these are two plots here, the 35 kilometer depth slice, that's the 150 kilometer depth slice, where you clearly see the nice outline of the mantle conductor. This here is now the Epsilon neodymium isotope data that we've got from the Hiltabar Sweet Granite. So remember, these are the, the granites that are where all the mineralization is associated with. And you see a much more evolved signature, evolved meaning that they've got a lot more crustal contamination or residence in the crust and or a more fertilized mantle along this path. And remember, this is the pathway where, which um, through the crust connects down to the mantle. So this is this thing here. Whereas when we go to the central part, where we know that the lithosphere is much more depleted, we see a more juvenile signature. So it means less crust contamination, but it also means we have a mantle that's probably much more depleted and less fertile than what's going on in the northeastern part of the world. Um, so this is the big picture, and you might wonder, well, what does it help us in order to find any deposits? The idea for us is that Ostland basically creates the underlying basic data set. And what we're trying to find is then some of these connectivity corridors that I've been talking about, um, what you see here. And the idea is then to do infill surveys. Um, Ken has been showing this profile across the Olympic Dam. This is actually an updated version now where Graham has collected, uh, Graham Heinze from University of Adelaide collected one kilometer space broadband site. So it's much better resolution than the 2006 published work uh, that we had, which was only had long period data. And you can really um, see very interesting features here. And I just want to point out some of them. Obviously, the so red color is very high connectivity. And we believe this to be the fossil fluid pathway. So really, where all the magmas and the fluids are being pushed through the crust from below up to the surface. And the geometry of it is also very interesting. You see that there's a mobile offset, and we only not only have this example, but other examples around South Australia or in Australia in general, that mobile offsets really seem to guide a lot of the fluid movement. So obviously mechanically weak, and you know, this is being used by fluids to come through and or melts. And we see a next mechanical boundary, which is the middle duct we made here, where quite often those connectivities are normally stalled. And then we have very discrete pathways in the upper crust. So we've got four here. One of them points right to Olympic Dam. We've got two other prospects that we know of. They're kind of sitting right on top where the other connectivity anomalies in upper crust are. And then the fourth, we don't actually know exactly what this is. So that's our way forward, um, really into this. I just want to show very quickly some of the results we have further to the east now. You know, there's the Konomono province, um, which is somewhat related. It has very similar tectonic events happening throughout its time. And here we see some really nice correlation, in fact, with uh, some diamond occurrences. This is just the uh, uh, plots here at 1, 10, 20, 30, 50, and 100 kilometers. Can't really see that actually. And it's very heterogeneous crust again, but especially in the slope mid crust as well, where we see this uh, Nakra arc, this conductivity anomaly has been known for a while, but the first time we could actually really map it out with, uh, with MT. And you can also see that a lot of the diamond occurrences here in yellow seem to be sitting on top of these conductors. Now, those diamonds come from very deep. There's been more petro uh, petrological studies that seem to suggest they come probably from the core mantle boundary. 
Um, but the idea is that perhaps some of the Kimber lines really came through the weak lithosphere, so exemplified again by the lower uh, resistivity rather than coming really through the resistive parts. So again, that helps us perhaps to understand you know, why we have some of those locations exactly where they are of the mineral deposits. I want to finish off now again going back up the scale, so not only to say Olympic Dam is the only examples, but this is a completely different mineralization style. This is some study we just published last year in GRL, um, looking at the northern Flinders Ranges. So again, the Gola Craton is more on this side here, the Kona province is here, and we have an active deformation system, or active uplift currently in the Flinders Ranges. The rocks are old, but the uplift is very young. So it's an active system that's actively under stress and strain. And we've done two MT profiles going across here. Uh, the area has also got a lot of heat flow, so um, there's really been an area of enhanced geothermal system. Exploration happening here around Paralana, which did not really eventuate, but we learned a lot from uh, studying it. Now the results that are coming out again are really interesting and very similar to what you see in OD. So these, this profile here is the one in the, in the northern part, the northern profile and the southern profile is on this um, right hand slide. And again, what you see here, just due to the topography uplift, you have a lot of high strain in the lower crust. And this high strain is exemplified and is very much on top of where we see the high connectivity anomaly in the lower crust, really widespread in between so 25 and 35 kilometers, slightly dipping um, out or towards the plane. And we see a very similar geometry again here, right? The connectivity anomaly sort of comes up to the middle ductile zone, gets stored there. It is a mechanical boundary, so it's very hard to break through. But if you keep pushing the system, then it finally starts to come through. And you see these very discrete upper crust or pathways in the middle domain come to the surface. Now, interestingly, this sits right underneath where we have the bevel uranium mine. It's an active uranium mine. Uranium is sediment hosted. Um, it's coming off the ranges, so the range front is out here. So this is about 10 or 15 kilometers off the range one, but the question is why does it exactly fall out there? And we kind of believe that this is actually the pathway, so that again the primary architecture of the crust brings up reductance along these pathways, so graphite and sulfide, and that causes the uranium to fall out exactly where it is. And so that's a fairly recent phenomenon, so again, you know, these features are probably active, so we have active or currently fluids in the system. And so what we believe is that, you know, you're actually seeing um, potassium feldspar precipitation dissolution reactions happening. So basically systems under stress, you have a metamorphic uh, breakdown reaction which creates permeability and porosity. And that's this is not an ongoing process that just pushes the fluid through the system and it sort of generates a lower crust and then kind of moves up the, the column um, up into the upper crust. So again, that kind of comes back to these things here. The you know, energy source in this case is active deformation stress into the system. You know, threshold barriers, brittle ductile zone. So it really kind of very nicely um, kind of goes into the schematic idea that we have about some of uh, mineral systems um, in, as a whole. So I just want to wrap up really kind of saying that, you know, we continue to fund um, really big magnetotelluric programs just because we see the value in them for mineral exploration. So our current status is to finish off Oslem. Uh, the green sites have just been deployed to so really pushing towards the northern uh, part. We're going to work with other jurisdictions, so we're not just going to stop at the borders, but really understand the entire lithospheric architecture of the country or the continent. And we're also planning to do more info surveys. This is an area south of Olympic Dam. This is focusing more on Kerapatina and some other prospects we have. Again, this is in this big fertility corridor just east of the Ola Craton. And we really want to do it in 3D. So before, we've done a lot of 2D profiles, but there's obvious limitations in terms of dimensionality, etc. And we really want to address this by collecting broadband data with fine site spacing uh, across a 100 by 100 kilometer area to really see how do these connectivity pathways look like in 3D. So with that, I want to finish off. And yeah, happy to have any questions. <coughs> Sites, we obviously have to deal with land access and logistical things. In really remote areas, the price would go up to five to six thousand dollars. It's not too bad. And broadband sites, I mean, contractors charge around about a thousand dollars per site, so um, it's all budgeted in. 
So I think, I mean, for, in terms of price, I would think it's quite competitive actually against other data sets that we know. But it depends all on your scale. If you, I think, if you're serious about it, if you wanted to do a 100 by 100 kilometer grid with um, one kilometer site spacing, you'd be getting a million dollars, which is a bit of an expense, but um, I still think it's, there's a lot of value in that. What about your data sets like gravity and magnetics? Seem too much. But you have those as well. We, so we already have them. Um, and again, you know, we are flying as part of Pace Copper, which is one of our, you know, South Australian government initiatives. We are flying a very big um, airborne survey right now. So the, all these processes are still ongoing, and they will keep on going. But this is a lot of already, I would say, maturity in that field. So we understand these data sets and. I guess companies are coming to us now and they say, well, we have a lot of these bumps, but we're not really sure which ones to do. So they're obviously looking for the next data set that could constrain you know, a lot of their bumps more. And the nice thing about Magnetoluix is that you have the depth constraint much better than the potential field methods. So it's just an additional complementary data set that would help your uh, potential field data. Well, we have very good ones, so you know, that's not the biggest problem in South Australia right now. So you may be able to go back and, and, and constrain some of Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Because so both ways. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks again. Yeah. Oh, question. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks very much for that talk. Uh, with regards to the Gawler craton and the uh, conductive zones that tend to pinch out as you get, uh, that are on either side of the craton, that tend to pinch out as you get to the brittle ductal transition makes all sorts of sense because we know that strain becomes more and more localized as you get higher up in the crust. Uh, but one would think that perhaps those structures, if they are structures, would continue up into the brittle crust, but perhaps they're so narrow that they're not resolvable in the, in the data set, so there could actually be fluid pathways that continue up into the shallow crust that are rooted down into those zones. Yeah, I mean, they might be smaller and then there's some point where you can't really resolve them. Yeah. It's obviously a function of your also sediment thickness. So if you have very thick sediment, you know, very narrow zone, you're never going to see it. But there's reason to believe. I mean, as you know, MT is sort of is sensitive to conductance, which is conductivity times thickness. So any of the pathways that you're seeing there could actually be narrow, but much more conductive than what they are. But they're clearly in the data. I mean, you can see it in the data that comes out in the modeling. So there's something there that's substantial enough for us to see. But it could be smaller ones that we missed. That's true.